What's your name? Well, my name is Jim, but most people call me Jim. Live from Joe's mom's fantastic basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey there, money fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and let's get this party started because today is National Martini Day. Joe's mom's got the vermouth, I've got the ice and olives, and man, is this going to be a party. Nothing like a Monday in the basement with a martini and the author of The Missing Semester, Gene Natale. Also, we'll share exciting money news, rip from the headlines, throw out the Haven lifeline to a lucky listener, and... Yeah, wait a minute, just got to take a sip of this. Oh, man, that's good. And then I'll also share my martini-related trivia. And here they are, two guys drier than a couple of martinis. <laughs> I am easily the best part of this show, man. <laughs> it's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. You know who these guys are. So do you like the blue cheese stuffed olives in your martinis? Or... You know how many times I've actually had a martini? I'm going to say once because they're terrible. <laughs> One time. And that was ex- it's like an old-fashioned. Have you ever had an old fashioned? Yes. Yeah. And you go, yeah, not me. Yeah. Yeah. Let's stick <laughs> it seems that thing. like a really cool thing to have. Let's stick the thing back in the old times when they had that, but before they came up with good drinks. Hey, everybody. I am Joe Salci. I average Joe Money on Twitter. And that voice who kicked us off, well, not uh, the one who's Sultry voice. carrying around the martini, the other one, uh, the one and only other guy, or as we call him, OG. What is up? So National Martini Day, uh, this is- I'm get... celebrating a little differently today. <laughs> I've, I've just got coffee. Check out, I'm sporting, of course, the Sparty mug, best mug ever, and uh, huh. ready to go. Got my podcaster t-shirt on. Nice. We are... all, this cool, all this cool swag that somehow doesn't make it to this side of the table. If, if, if you went to one of the conferences- I'm never invited. You, you're always, don't, don't do that. It's hard to walk around with a bag on your head. You run into stuff and people. It's just awkward. Here's a question for you. Unrelated question. Are you familiar with the acronym BM? <laughs> I don't even know where to go with that. Well, uh, just go ahead. Wh- whatever your joke is, carry on. There is no joke. BM is before M1 Finance. Oh. You know, we're talking about old fashioned. Well, back in okay. the Stone Age, before M1 Finance, we call that period BM. <laughs> <laughs> Investing your money on your own was intimidating, time-consuming, and expensive. You had to calculate and input every trade you wanted to make, and then you were hit with a commission every time you clicked a button. Forget about buying that one stock you wanted with a high share price, OG. Forget about that. Thankfully, M1's completely changed the investing game because you can now build and own a diversified investment portfolio made up of the stocks and exchange-traded funds that you pick You basically tell M1 what you want to own, and then M1 automates your plan. It's incredibly easy and intuitive to build your portfolio and customize it to your liking. Then it's as easy to manage as a savings account. You simply deposit or withdraw money. M1 uses intelligent automation and fractional shares to invest every penny in the most efficient way. I like this idea of fractional shares. I think that's that is uh, a competitive advantage. By the way, let's say that you don't want to create your own portfolio, OG. They have professionally done portfolios already for you, like the ugh, robo-advisors, as they're called. It's the comprehensive investing platform. Here's what it costs. Your first thousand of the platforms free. They charge only 0.25% for all balances up to 100,000 and 0.15% if you're over 100,000. Do yourself a favor and check it out on the web at stackybenjamins.com forward slash M, the number one finance. That's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash M, the number one finance, or download their slick mobile app on iOS or Android. M1 Finance, be invested. We're getting invested in a great show today. Gene Natale coming down to the basement. We're talking financial education, big deal, financial literacy. We love talking financial literacy. I know, OG, you're every bit as passionate about that as I am. Let's get that game started. But first... Our headlines. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. First headline comes to us from Napa-Net, the National Association of Plan Advisors. A new report out OG suggests fee compression is, quote, much ado about nothing. 
It says, while fee compression is a concern for many broker dealers and advisors, the more they can demonstrate the value they provide to clients, the less likely they will feel pressured to lower their fees, InvestNet suggests in a new report. In addition to communicating their value proposition to clients, InvestNet further recommends advisors should actually show all the methods they employ to add value for their clients. This is interesting because when I started in the industry, it's funny, I was told initially, you know, don't show your client how you did anything, right? If you showed them how you did it, then they go do it themselves. New report right. says, show them everything that you're doing, which by the way, we had Austin Cleon on the show and he has this book called Show Your Work. And said, so it isn't that the information's not out there, it's the right information. If you can show people how you get to your end result, that's how you're showing them value. There's a lot of discussion these days in the world of marketing and business coaching around giving away 99% of the work that you do for free, right? You, you and I have talked about this offline a number of times. I remember being an advisor years ago where kind of the same thing. You just wanted to keep all of your secrets, your secrets, as opposed to just go, hey, here's, here's how I calculated this. Here's how I came up with this. Here's how I came to this conclusion. And I do think that there's a push toward demonstrating other areas of value that you provide to clients beyond kind of the, the normal investment management or, you know, I produce this plan for you. Sometimes I jokingly say to clients, if we save them some money on taxes or something, I'll say, you know, we just saved you $40,000 in taxes. That, that's got me some goodwill for a while, right? <laughs> you know, and we try to, you know, I kind of have fun with it, but you'll forget about that stuff. If you're a client, I do, you know, I forget about things that other people have done for me and the impact that it's had. And so that's going to be more important. And I, and I agree with this article that if you're providing tons of value as an advisor, you shouldn't have to worry about. Which, which goes back price. to, remember when the robo-advisor thing first hit and we predicted that advisors that were going to try to compete with a robo, and that was what they were doing, those advisors would feel fee compression, right? They, they would have yeah. to slash fees because robos were going to lead them there. Advisors that were actually holistic and were helping people live their life in a way that's financially responsible, those people weren't going to have any problem at all. And it's proving to be true. What's that quote? The rumors of my demise are greatly exaggerated or something like that. I mean, we see it kind of working both ways, right? Financial advisor fee compression isn't happening. And also the robo advisors are raising their fees. They kind of came in at, hey, we can do this at X rate, realized it's not profitable. I, I'm not convinced that they're to the point yet where they are going to be profitable. I, I think that there's some some increases coming. Well, you've got uh, companies that. like, look at their, to your point, they're all swimming upstream. Personal Capital has advisors. Now they've had a model with advisors since the beginning, but uh, Betterment now has their, you know, advisory platform. Yep. And there's another problem there too, is that uh, there's just not enough people to go around. And I'm not talking about clients. I'm talking about advisors, you know, Vanguard, Wealthfront, Betterment, Personal Capital. There's four of them right there. I just read an article, Betterment, or I'm sorry, Vanguard brought in $65 billion last year in their personal advisor services. I mean, that's an awful lot of money to bring in did, and not have a, enough souls to help manage it. Did you see the news recently that Rick Edelman also is the big financial advisor, been Barron's number mm -hmm. one advisor a few times? Rick Edelman's getting into mergers and acquisitions. <laughs> He's been in mergers and acquisitions. What do you mean? He's getting into it. He actually said in this article just a couple of weeks ago, said he hasn't been in it. And I know he's merged in and- Like personally, are you talking personally or business-wise or are you talking about like for clients? No, business-wise, the markets that they serve, they are going after other firms to take their clients. They're, oh yeah, to buy the firm or something like yes, that. Yes, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, No, he at a higher level, of course, has been- But what's interesting, been, they're not trying to increase market share in new markets. They're trying to control the markets where they already are. Yeah. Yeah. Which is an interesting approach. I mean, what are they doing? Are they trying to put the other guys just out of business? Is that the deal? Well, I think maybe they're coming in to buy out the firm, right? You know, if you're a solo practitioner and you're sure. 65 years old, I mean, there, there is that component of the, our business too, which is the graying of the population. Now we're not out there laying bricks and digging ditches. So, you know, we can kind of have a longer than kind of normal 
work career, but, uh, but still you got to have someplace, something to do with your clients and, and clients, the older, older I get, I know the more questions I get about what happens if you get hit by a bus, which I take offense to, cause I don't even hey, come near a bus. We've, we've been talking about this from the advisor side. Let's talk about this from that side, from the client side. If your advisor doesn't want to talk about how they're doing things and open up and kind of show them, these are the mechanisms I'm using to make these decisions. I think it's probably time for that advisor to go bye-bye. Well, you need to have a fair understanding of why it is you're doing what you're doing. The way that I believe in working with clients is you want to have conversations with them that tells them what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I don't expect you to have the 20 years experience knowledge to figure it out. That's why you're having me do it. But by the same token, you it's your money. So you got to have a pretty good feeling for why you're doing what you're doing, right? Yeah, I think that's an important, um, most important part of the relationship, according to this article, is uh, your advisor showing them how and, and why they, they do things. Our next uh, headline comes to us from the Wall Street Journal. This is by Jason Zweig. Uh, Sorry, stock pickers. History shows you underperform in bad markets, too. I found this funny. Jason says, propaganda dies hard. Even as evidence continues to mount that stock pickers have underperformed the market averages, active managers insist they will make a comeback. Analyst at Bank of America Merrill Lynch found earlier this month that 63% of active fund managers investing in large U.S. stocks outperformed their benchmarks in April, the best since February 2015. So two-thirds of them got it right. Nice. It's the best since February 2015, and we're having a flipping parade. Because two, because two out of three beat their benchmark one month out of the last two years, yeah. two and a half years, yeah. in the last two years. Well, and so and so, let's talk about the active passive debate, and we're talking about active investment management versus passive investment management, and the active managers still control the vast majority of the money, despite all of the money going into Vanguard and that sort of thing. Which, by the way, Vanguard has active managers too. Sure, right, they do. We are not suggesting, and I think people get hung up on this, that there are not people who can beat the market. Because there are. I mean, just evidenced by your study there from Bank of America. Two-thirds of the people in April did. I'm suggesting that we cannot pick those people in advance. And if they've done it 20 years in a row, we have no way statistically to take that data, 20 years in a row of beating it, to apply to a new set of data of will they do it the next year because it doesn't carry over, right? So there are people who do it. We can't predict who those people are in advance. Therefore, it doesn't make sense to pay for them to try to do it, has always been our approach. But active, passive, you know, it's not going away anytime soon. He talks about down markets because the thing you hear over and over, the propaganda you hear, according to Jason, I love that term that you hear from active managers, is that, is that when the market goes down, Active managers. That's, that's when they're going to shine. That's when they shine. And uh, why doesn't Jason just call that fake news? <laughs> well, he does. I mean, he's totally he's totally calling it out in this in this piece. Listen to this. He says that uh, during the financial crisis from late 2007 through early 2009, S&P lost 50.2 percent. Mm, average glorious, US, a glorious cleansing. The average U.S. stock mutual fund fell 49.7. <sighs> Blew him out of the water. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nah, 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 nah. I beat you by 50 in the, days. In the bear market of 2000 to 2002, as internet stocks imploded, S&P 500 lost 43.4. The average fund lost 43.2. Boom. That just happened. Drop the mic. Mic drop. <laughs> There's our 0.2%. That pays for what? One quarter of one year's of expenses. Yeah. So, I'll, yeah. I'll link to this in the show notes because I like a, Jason's why he's uh, he's got a great one of my favorite books on money, your money in your brain. Yeah, that's a great read. Fun stuff. I think our lessons for today are uh, active versus passive. And by the way, active versus passive. We could have another talk about this sometime. OG still kind of the wrong dragon. I mean, dragon number five. Right. Mm -hmm. But but OK, uh, active management propaganda. Uh, it is propaganda. And then. <laughs> Or as you called it, fake news. And then, I came up with that. Fake news, TM. TM. And then the other lesson from today, have an advisor who thinks they're doing a bunch of abracadabra and doesn't want to show you the magic trick and how it works. Might be time for a new one. Back. 
Back in 2013, OG, Gene Natale and uh, Matt Kabbalah wrote a book called The Missing Semester, which basically says there's a, something that doesn't appear often enough in classrooms, and that is financial literacy. The book won the Excellence in Financial Literacy Education, the Eiffel Award, in 2013. Gene, since then, has been working with companies like Vanguard, Carnegie Mellon, University of Pittsburgh on financial literacy programs around the country. And he's got some new information for us. Maybe financial literacy we can do a better job on. And he thinks, he hopes, he might have picked the lock. And I love talking about this he cracked topic. the code. All let's, right, let's hear it. Let's talk about uh, teaching financial literacy. And Gene Natale joins us. Welcome back, dude. Hey, Joe. Thank you. Great to be back. It's uh, been a couple of years. I know. What have you been doing these past couple of years? Because it seems like you've, uh, well, hopefully started to pick the lock on helping kids uh, get into the money game. At least trying. Uh, since we last spoke, two things. Uh, certainly considering a lot of our high school efforts. And I now teach a course here at the University of Pittsburgh that this school designed around the missing semester. So I'm able to add two different perspectives with respect to the young folks. I want to start with your story first, Gene, because I think this is this would be interesting. There's got to be a story behind you and financial literacy and the reason why you're so excited about this. Where did your journey start? How did you start to get interested in financial literacy? So in full candor, I'm, I'm old enough that I'm starting to get forgetful. <laughs> uh, I often joke when I'm in front of the high school classrooms. I, I started my Roth IRA at the age of 16. I'm 37 years old now to date myself. And I don't remember how or why I started it. I wish I could. I just know that I did. With respect to the specifics on your question, it's kind of a threefold start uh, because the, the Roth IRA example I just gave you is an example of being lucky, not good. But when we started writing the missing semester, it wasn't because we had the foresight to look into the high school and college classroom and say, boy, a book like this is needed. It was kind of threefold. The first and most important was observations of family members and friends who were in their early 30s, had done everything right, everything we're taught to do, great education, terrific jobs. But Joe, these folks were close to dead broke. Uh, so something was missing when you do everything right, and yet financial freedom is so far. And then two other components that really spearheaded the initial effort a few years ago was one that the media really starting to pick up on the negatively trending statistics on the financial literacy, i.e. Money 101 front. And third and last, from nine to five, I work for an institutional investment firm. So I don't work with individuals uh, in, in my day job, but we work with defined benefit and large pension funds. And I began to observe the reliance that folks had on these pension funds that were never designed to be their sole source of retirement income. So the, all those kind of the culmination came together with a heavy overweighting on the family and friend observations, um, um, including my wife, who, uh, what do they say, love is blind, but she had some heavy six figure debt the day we got married. <laughs> and and uh, you married her anyway, so it must be a heck of a person. Uh, Joe, you could do a case study. She had cost of living loans from college, but that, that was many years ago and, and things are much improved. So, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that see all these same things that you're seeing, Gene, yet you decided to get in the trench. Why did you do that? It became a passion. And I really can't remember what made us actually get in the trench. Partially, it might have been my past career prior to getting involved in investments. I was a swim coach, which is odd enough, but started about the age of 15 and did so about to the age of 25. And I had a real emotional attachment to my swimmers, to the lifeguard. And actually, even at that age, was steering them towards Roth IRA. So something had clicked. But I think I just have a, a very genuine caring for people. And this is a subject that is in young people's control. And, and that is so rare uh, in our education system. You know, some of us are good at math. Others good at science, social studies, English. This subject is the rare subject that impacts everyone. And that everyone, in the, and I believe this even now, Joe, after many high school experiences across different demographics, every young person can control their financial future independent of their background. I think that's a powerful statement. Well, it is a powerful statement because you know as well as I do, there are issues with poverty in America. There's issues with education, not just about finance, but just education in general. You know, kids come to school with a lot of baggage. 
Absolutely, that is accurate. And a surprising, and I get this question a fair amount, and regularly in front of high schools and high school students, very different backgrounds, very different socioeconomics. The questions the students ask are the same. And I think that's interesting. What are the questions that the students ask? They're primarily focused not on, can I afford this or how much should I borrow to go to school? There are questions about, is this real, Gene? Is it true that if I, if I save some money now, I'll have more later because I don't understand how that works? And the observation from that is that the kids are seeing opportunity through the presentation. And a follow-up observation to that comment is that we're all human. And at the end of the day, when we know something's a problem, we say, boy, I know it's a problem, but I'll solve it tomorrow. And then tomorrow becomes three, five, ten years later. We're the exact opposite when presented with opportunities. We don't want to miss out. And I think these, these students have opened my eyes to that kind of way of teaching. So is there an issue then here, Gene, where we, we're approaching kids wrong, you think, that we haven't really picked the lock on how to, but, but because if they're interested in the beginning, but they're still not getting the education, like where do you think the breakdown is? To answer your question, yes, in, in capital, boldface fonts with exclamation marks. Thank Joe. So as a society, we've done a terrific job, and I'm sure you're many of the same email lists that I am in terms of financial literacy updates, ways to tackle the problem. We have done an incredible job as a society of teaching people how to afford the things they want. We've mastered that skill set. Well, and sadly, I think we've also taught them how to use uh, debt products successfully to get them, right? Absolutely. It's one of the tools in which they do so right. to accomplish their goal. Uh, so many you, you were taught how to budget, how to do this, and we've mastered that. Imagine if the first lesson was presenting the opportunity that age presents. If the first lesson was, well, boy, if you're 16, 17, 18, 19, early 20s, and you start saving now, look what can happen. And, and I can tell you uh, kind of just a personal story. After we wrote The Missing Semester, we were frequently asked to come talk in front of high school and college classrooms. And unfortunately for the audiences, I wasn't very good at it. And that's because I had the misconception that scare tactics would work, that scaring them about student loans and credit card debt would open their eyes. And Joe, it did the exact opposite. They closed their eyes and in some cases put their heads on their desk. Why do you think that is? I think it's because these kids are smart kids. They know that credit cards are problems. They know they shouldn't borrow six figures for student loans, but we're living in a society that is very well orchestrated in terms of convincing us to spend money. Uh, we've learned that lesson. And I had two choices after kind of seeing that. I said, boy, I was getting pretty emotionally attached to some of these students saying, boy, I'm missing something. What are we missing here? And what we learned was that the kids' heads would come back up off the desk when we started talking about the Roth IRA. Really? Showing something that they could actually take control of. And then I started to get letters from high school teachers, from high school students saying, can you tell me more about the Roth IRA? How can I help my students? To the point where we really shifted the focus to if we make the opportunity, the bulk of the presentation, well, these are smart kids. They're going to learn the rest on their own. They're going to learn how to not overspend. They're going to learn not to do a credit card because they're going to understand what they're giving up if they do so. Joe, if we had video, I would. I wish I could show you the looks on, on the students' faces, both in the high school settings. Eyes go huge. Do you think we would be talking football on Sunday with the reactions that these students give to this message of opportunity? I just think that the, you know, the Roth IRA is such a horrible name, like 401k, right? It's just, it's this nebulous financial term. Like what, what the heck does Roth IRA even really mean until you dig into the, the, you know, dig into what you can do with it. Is it an opportunity then for them to become wealthy? Is that what they're interested in? Is it an opportunity for freedom to grow their money or do they have this feeling that it's the right thing? Like what piece of the Roth IRA is it that turns them on? I think that the Roth IRA and, and saving at a young age is a really bold comment. Age is an opportunity powerful enough to transform the lives of a generation. And the Roth IRA is a tool to do this. Why? Why? Because if you're, let's talk to high school audience first, 16, 17, 18 years old. What's your tax rate? 
probably close to 0%. Right. And you can make a contribution to your Roth IRA with your summer job that essentially will never be taxed. And extremely powerful, it co-functions as an emergency fund. So if you and I were presenting to an audience, let's say where you and I got asked to give the validator the keynote talk at a graduation of 200 high school students, you would tell all of them that it's important to have an emergency fund. It absolutely is. Statistically, how many will need it? 7% of the 200? Right. So if all 200 are putting money under their mattress for a rainy day, you and I would be doing them a disservice. If we steer all 200 to the Roth IRA and only 7% need to tap that in a true emergency, we've just done a really good thing to the 93%. You're dead on, though. The, the name is not one that encourages an exciting conversation. Right, right. <laughs> but then, so how do you, do you think this is the type of thing that starts at home? Like parents listening to this should be teaching their kids about compounding interest or, or about the Roth and how it works? I mean, uh, how do we start that conversation? You know, for so many years, this was a conversation that was kind of taboo. You didn't talk to friends about money. You couldn't ask mom or dad at the dinner table. And then teachers began diving in and saying, well, someone's got to teach this. Uh, we have a high school here in, in, in Pennsylvania where the teacher gives extra credit for any student that opens a Roth IRA during the semester. How powerful is that? But it does absolutely should start at home. It should start around the dinner table. What about these? What about these? Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about poverty and a teacher giving kids extra credit. They open up the Roth IRA. What if there's other priorities at home? I mean, it seems like. How do kids put the money into the Roth IRA? Yep. First, I'll answer the, the your question. Then I'll talk about the physical, how you, how you do it. So, again, if, if you and I are talking, let's say we go to very five, uh, not, not to be biased, but let's say to pick the five poorest high schools in the country. You're going to have a little bit of a different conversation, yes. And using numbers and statistically speaking, you won't reach everyone. Um, but I can I've had firsthand experience in some of these classrooms so where I shake hands with these kids and they promise me they're going to open Roth IRA. And that's because while they do have the, the food, the basic necessities, food, shelter, clothing covered at home, you're correct. There isn't much left over. But here's what's missed. A lot of young people think you need to have a lot of money to make a lot of money. Uh, so w Warren Buffett's, you know, in his 80s now, he made, I think, 95% of his net worth after the age of 60. 95%. And what we've done, we put out a new video series on YouTube that tries to demonstrate this, is to show these young people what happens if they save 25 cents a day. Because that's possible for just about everyone. And once you started saving that 25 cents a day, what if you bump it up to 50 cents a day? And then a dollar a day when you can, with an end goal of $3 a day. We set the goals realistic. We model it to these young people what they can do. And, and Joe... Oh, my gosh. I mean, you name the demographic and we see the enthusiasm when young people say, holy cow, this is something I can do. I can control this. I would say it's off the charts. And I would say that I am failing at bottling that enthusiasm and delivering it on a larger scale. Do you have some of those numbers, by the way, the uh, if somebody saves a quarter a day, if a kid saves that? I can give you one. Um, so the baseline for Roth IRAs, you need a thousand dollars in a job, in taxable income. Gotcha. If you don't have a thousand dollars today. You need to save $3 a day for a year or a dollar a day for three years. Set that goal. Try to make it happen. Once you open it with that $1,000, you don't need to put in a nickel for the rest of your life. So I'll, I'll model out, and this, this isn't one of the videos, and you know there are great compound interest calculators online that to the teachers in your audience, we use these at the University of Pittsburgh, and the results are just incredible. The students get excited. They take ownership. They model them to their personal lives. Uh, and I've seen the same in the high school classroom. Let's say you and I are 18 years old, high school seniors. We listen to your podcast today and we say, well, this summer I've got a summer job. I'm, I'm going to save. I'm going to start a Roth IRA. I put my thousand dollars in at the age of 18. And I do, I put in the S and P 500 index fund, 500 largest companies in America. It's averaged 11 point, I think 1% annually for the last hundred years. We could argue the pros and cons of that, but let's just give right. an example. <laughs> if you do that and do nothing else, Joe, for the rest of your life, and now we're going to say we're living longer, so you're going to retire at 70. Young people in the audience, that's really important. 65 is no longer the retirement age. That's a good thing because it is because of health. Sure. You have $226,000 at the age of 70. I've literally had students pound the desk, say, Gene, that's not possible. If this was possible, the whole country would be doing it. Right. 
And then you say it is possible. And I had an, a, a professional in the industry who I like to kind of go to. I said, why are young people so intimidated? Why are we not teaching this? And he's a bit of a conspiracy. And he said, Gene, well, boy, so much of the industry just doesn't want people to realize how easy this is. Uh, that's the first time I thought of it from that perspective. I'm not much of a conspiracy guy, but it is easy. And young people can take control to your specific question now. So $1,000 at the age of 18 can become 227000 at the age of 70 with nothing else. If that young person does 10 extra dollars a month, so that's about a quarter a day, maybe 30 cents, it almost it doubles that to half a million dollars at the age of 70. And that seems super manageable to kids. It's something that they think they can control. It sounds easy, right? It, it's, it's like the joke about eating the elephant one bite at a time. You're exactly right. So here's what often happens. You now just set a goal that's achievable. So the young people are excited. They say, boy, I get that. I can do this. Gene, I can do this. All right, let's shake hands. You go do it. And then the next question is, what happens if I if I save um, you know $20 a month, Gene? Because I think I could do that too. And then you get the, the overachiever there that says, what's the most I can save? And you will use these calculators. And Joe, you should see the interaction in the classroom. These kids start to get so excited. Now, in addition to realizing they can control their financial future, another thing's happening. They start talking about job. Boy, I should get that job. Hmm, Maybe I should work a second job. Gene, am I allowed to work two jobs? And it sparks an incredible dialogue. That's exciting. So instead of the whip, it's the carrot. This kind of stuff starts at home. But let's talk about in the school because you're diving into the schools you know, you, you were on the show a couple of years ago talking about how the education system needs to change. Since you've been on before, are you seeing that change? Is there kind of a shift in education where personal finance is being addressed or is this, uh, are we still really failing? I'll answer two ways. One, the national statistics would suggest we're failing because they've worsened since you and I last talked. No. That is disappointing. But not worse and meaningful. You could, you could argue their status quo, but they're a little bit worse. But what we are seeing is a great number of high school teachers. Uh, we did a, a continuing education program here in Pennsylvania that 63 high schools participated in. Teachers are taking ownership. They're squeezing this in into history classes, math classes, English classes, you name it. They're figuring out a way to get this subject to their students. And they're doing an incredible job. We get some of the assignments that schools build out around the missing semester these schools, these teachers are doing great work at the ground level. That's excellent. But I mean, the scary thing here though, Gene, is that it is at the ground level. It's not, uh, it sounds like it's not really a, you know, a piece of the overall curriculum. It's, it's just the teacher grabbing the bull by the horns. True. So here, so one, another thing we have, that's, I think very interesting. I'm on the board of our CFA society here in Pittsburgh. That's chartered financial analysts. That's a uh, society of investment finance professionals. The president of our board is the dean of Penn State's Barron College in Erie, Pennsylvania. They're performing a research uh, analysis on a joint program that the missing semester put on with CFA Society Pittsburgh. That This will be year two. This research team has done over 90 different research projects. The two findings from year one of their study are this is the first time ever that 100% of the statistics they measured showed improvement. 100% of the financial statistics showed improvement in these schools. And second and most interestingly, the area of greatest improvement. And Joe, this is not, there's no teaching around this. These schools are getting a copy of the missing semester. The teachers are getting an education program and a high five and saying, go get them. And the number one area of improvement is the Roth IRA from an unbiased study of high school students. So there's a study saying this is working too. The hope from that research team is that that gets published in the next year and creates some greater awareness. Right. But it's showing you that there are results. And when people see results at the higher level, they'll probably all, similar to how the young people are chasing opportunity, when schools are seeing results from other schools, they're not going to want to be left behind. Well, I'm so glad you could come on and talk about it because I would have never thought in a million years, Gene, that the Roth IRA was the linchpin, right, to financial, <laughs> to financial education. Now, let's say there's someone saying, boy, I don't have $1,000. That's a whole other conversation. Invest, it's investing in general. It's opportunity. It's so often, Joe, you should, some of the teachers in the classroom will say, you know, they're so brutally honest that their students will say, I made mistakes. I can't do this to you, junior class in my high school. You can't. And when you see these teachers get emotional about this subject or a dean of a school, 
it shows you that, yes, there, there's some momentum behind this message of opportunity. Yeah, that's great stuff. How do people get their own copy of The Missing Semester and um, how do they reach you for more? So they can contact me directly from our website, themissingsemester.com. The book's available online in most bookstores and we sell bulk orders uh, directly to the institutions that purchase. That's fantastic. And we'll have uh, links to all those in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Gene, great talking with you again, man. Joe, thank you. Keep up the great work. Well, you too. Thank you. What is up, trivia fans? I'm Joe's mom's Doug. Neighbor Joe's mom's Doug. <laughs> Whatever. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor Doug. Yeah. And we're celebrating National Martini Day here in the basement today with today's, man, that's a lot of today's, today's happy hour trivia. And I got martinis on the brain and in my glass. This is the second one, and I am feeling absolutely fabulous about this trivia. If you're also a fan of martinis, today's trivia should be easy peasy. The martini seemed headed to extinction in the 1960s when one count him one movie character single-handedly revived the public's thirst for the drink which movie character revived the martini i'll be back with this glorious answer after i go get a refill talked about this stat before, but this is scary. According to a 2016 Gallup poll, 48% of all Americans don't own any stock. And I realize it can be dawning when it's time to start something new, but here's a great thing. Getting invested is more to do with taking baby steps than leaping headfirst into Wall Street. Here's Brian Barnes, founder of M1 Finance, on just how easy it is to be invested. So you just either log on to the website or use the mobile application. We're native on Android and iOS, and it takes about three minutes, and your first $1,000 that you deposit is managed for free. I'd love to say the free $1,000 is a special deal I made for you, but uh, Brian and M1 Finance are that good to everybody. With M1, you can select from one of dozens of professionally designed portfolio pies, or you can customize it, as mom says, to your heart's content. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash M1 Finance for more. That's stackingbenjamins.com. M, the number one, finance.com for more. So just fire up their mobile app, M1 Finance, be invested. Hey, money fans, it's your old... Oh, I'm just going to say it. Don't you think I'm pretty much your best friend? I'm <laughs> probably the best thing in your life. And to prove it... I've got another martini and your trivia answer. In the 1960s, the martini was starting to go out of fashion, but which character single-handedly brought the drink back into vogue? Of course, it was the one and only Bond, James Bond. You may know that when Bond ordered his, it wasn't nearly as good as the one I'm drinking right now because he asked for it shaken not stirred god the philistine great bartenders will tell you that a shaken martini is <coughs> sorry diluted it's a diluted martini in fact earl the best bartender in texarkana won't even let you order them shaken down at the sizzler bar so go for stirred not shaken trust me on this one and gin always get gin i'm telling you that is the only real martini oh yeah and an olive i love olives don't you just love olives joe okay i'll see ya so close i said austin powers but um <laughs> turns out it was the other less famous british actor yeah james british, who? james who yeah double o something it was so sad Eight. roger moore dying and before daniel craig he was my favorite bond and I don't know if you've seen this before, but your favorite Bond is mostly based on when you grew up. Somebody did a study on this. Like if you grew up in the in the 90s, you probably liked Pierce Brosnan or... Um, Sean Connery. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, but Daniel Craig, I think, is the best Bond. I, th I think Daniel Craig is... Oh, I, I really hope that he does one more, right? I so hope so. 
Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's, or rather, life insurance's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they've been spearheading innovation within the life insurance industry by focusing on what you value most. What are those things, OG? It's not toast and... Avocados. (laughs) That's a whole uh, whole different rant. No, it's your money. It's not your money. It's your family and your time. That's why they created a high quality and most importantly, affordable term life insurance policy issued by Mass Mutual that you can purchase entirely online. No need to wait several weeks for a decision when you can get one, bam, right now with Haven Life. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote and learn about life insurance the modern way. That's stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. Today we're throwing out the Haven Lifeline to our new friend, Dan. Say hello, Dan. Hello, enjoy the show. I just have a quick question about savings bonds. I'd like to look at series EE savings bonds as a hedge against deflation, being that if you hold them for the 20 years, they'll double in value at 3.5% interest. If for some reason, and hopefully interest rates will go up, when they do, then I could just go ahead and redeem them and get the higher rate. But if they don't, I view that as a nice hedge against deflation. Just curious what your thoughts are on that. And also your view on I-bonds as a hedge against inflation. Just a small portion of the portfolio, um, no more than uh, 5%, but I just thought it'd be something worth asking you about. Thank you. Oh, thanks for the question, Dan. Uh, We haven't gotten many questions about double E-bonds and I-bonds. I'm excited about this. Yeah, I haven't haven't given them any thought whatsoever (laughs) in 15 years. Oh, I bonds and E bonds. So I bonds, just kind of as a quick uh, history of these, I guess, right? Came out probably what about late '90s, I guess, somewhere in there. Have a fixed value, and then an interest rate that's declared by the government based on inflation. So arguably, the idea is that it's going to keep up with inflation. E bonds are set the interest rate based on the market the month that they're issued. So you buy a $25 bond, it's issued with X percent interest rate based on today. And that's what it is from now until it stops paying interest. Guaranteed fixed rate. Yep. And so usually it takes between 12 and 15 years for those to double. They continue to pay interest until year 30 when they cease paying interest. So if you go in your closet and you've got a stack of savings bonds, that were issued more than 30 years ago, they stopped paying interest. As a complete side note, I had a client that had a family member who passed away, and this was probably in the late 2000, like 2006, 2008 timeframe. She had savings bonds from her family member that she was inheriting. He had passed away that he had inherited from his parents that stopped paying interest in 1970. So it's savings bonds that were issued in 1940 that stopped paying interest in 1970 and gathered dust from 1970 to 2007, 2008. That makes my head hurt. Oh gosh, it's miserable. So just kind of keep track of those if you've got some old ones. When we look at savings bonds, somebody brings in a, a stack of savings bonds or, or nowadays you can keep track of it electronically. I'm looking specifically at the interest rate. And some of them, if you had them issued at the right time, are paying six, six and a half percent. Right. And those are fun ones to keep. Sure. Most nowadays, I suspect, are probably in the two percent range. I haven't looked at them in a really long time. But my guess is, is that that's about where they are, two, two and a half. And I wouldn't use them for anything ever in a million years. So as a hedge against inflation or deflation, I don't think that it's going to be meaningful enough. If you think that inflation is going to happen, then the best place to be is in equities because stocks will rise their earnings, their earnings will rise and you'll be a part of the rising earnings and rising dividends at a multiple of what inflation is. So if inflation, you know, goes really high, you're going to be protected there. And I think the deflationary talk is a bunch of Pollyanna stuff, I don't really see that happening ever. And if it does, it's a blip on the radar. And if it does happen, and you've only put 5% of your portfolio in it, it's not going to matter anyway. So I don't really see that as a protection mechanism. The big question for me when we talk 20 years is you you have to make an even bigger bet, which is, are we going to bet on the economy or against the economy over a 20-year period? It's easy for me to bet against the economy in a five-year period, in a six-year period. 
But over a 20-year period, it's a very, very difficult bet for me to say that we're going to have a horrible time for 20 years. The- well, even, even to your point, the economy, you could also look at it globally, right? You're betting against the whole world's economy. Because it's not to say that you can, you know, you're only going to invest in the United States. Well, and that's why I have a difficult time with it because, you know, when I look at the economy over 20 years, once again, I go right back to equities because for companies to continue to exist, they have to have a profit, right? I mean, if a company doesn't have a profit for 20 years, they're gone. I mean, unless you're Amazon, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> and people just continually feed you more money, even though you can't make money. That was a joke, by the way. I think they figured out how to make money now. Yeah, yeah. But overall, if a company doesn't make money for that amount of time, the the company's gone. So over a 20-year period, I look at if I'm betting on the economy, I then have to bet on stocks, right? Because uh, of the role that they play in keeping the economy moving. I would be more interested on the fixed income side to explore a combination of U.S. versus international fixed income where you're going to pick up the changes in currency valuation, you're going to pick up the changes in different economies and have a little bit better yield than just, uh, than just us. With a 20 year time frame with a small part of the portfolio, I play a completely different game. I'm looking at natural resources and precious metals. I mean, that's where, that's, that's, that's where my head is. And you know, maybe I'm not, yeah, that's uh, not fixed income at all. That's no, no alternatives. No, but still I'm diversifying the portfolio in a different way. And if I get deflation of the dollar, there's only so much precious metal out there. I think that I get a decent reaction in precious metals. That's all gobbledygook. Don't think so? (laughs) No. (laughs) I guess we'll just wait 20 years and see. Yeah. That's right. But your point is right on. If this is 20 year money, you got to invest it like 20 year money, not five year money. But if you're playing alternatives... I think for 20 years. Well, alternative, yeah. I mean, we're, yeah. Playing, I, I, I moved pl- off that. Playing the precious metals game, I guess my point, versus playing a fixed interest rate double E-bond game over a 20-year period. Natural resources, metals, real estate, all are great diversifiers. and For, f- for, a, long, for a long time frame, too. a long too. time. Yeah, yeah good yeah, stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. Thanks for the question, Dan. If you've got a question, we can throw out the lifeline to you, the Haven Lifeline. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And uh, we will get right on it. Dan sent us this message three days before we recorded this. That's how quickly we're getting to these. Hey, boom. You got questions, we got answers. Make it happen. Then we go over to the mailbag, and Doug just brought down the mail. And this piece of mail comes to us from our friend Todd. Todd says he currently owns a small business OG. It's set up as an S corp profit normally runs from 70 to 90,000. And Todd has about 50,000 in business savings. This has helped open up my personal finances over the last couple of years, to which the only debt I have is my mortgage. I owe $90,000, have 14 years left to pay, and the interest rate's 2.85%. My wife and I now max out our 401k and Roth IRA every year. I also have three children, one in college, and the other two will be in college over the next three years. 529 plan, probably useless at this point. They're all employed by the company, and I plan on paying them the $5,250 each year for tuition that I'm eligible for. This will pay off some, but not all the expenses. I have no other money for them saved for college expenses. I also have no emergency savings other than that company savings and $11,000 in Roth money, which I could use if necessary. I currently have $475 a month that I have available. What should I do with this money? One, education for the kids. Two, emergency savings. Three, taxable mutual fund account or stock account. Four, just one of these. Five, all these. Spread the wealth. <laughs> I'm interested in hearing your thoughts. Thanks, Todd. A lot of moving parts there. Holy shnikes. I think there's only one. Survive college. Well, uh, Sur- what's that? Build your emergency fund and survive college. Well, as somebody who's just got through it or kind of the very end of it, you can attest to that pretty well. I wonder if he means when he says I have 70000 in profit from my S-Corp, I wonder if he means that that's his earnings or I wonder if he means I get paid and I also have 70000 in profit. But he's just talking about the 500 a month basically, right? Yeah, I have a feeling that's what he's living off of. Yeah, okay. I don't so, know that. So yeah, totally just hang tight, batten down the hatches. I agree with that 100 and 30%. I mean, continue um, maximizing his 401k and doing the yeah, Roth. still I doing mean, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, still do all that stuff. I've got another question that I would encourage him to look at. I, you just kind of glossed over it, but I want him to double check that. He said something about I'm paying my kids the 
the full 5250 that's eligible, blah, 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 blah. Double check and make sure. I know what he's talking about there. It's a really kind of finite rule in the benefits packaging for uh, S-Corps. But um, double check with a, uh, with a CPA that you're eligible for that. I have heard some rumblings about uh, using that on yourself, which effectively you are. You know, they're your kids, right? And that might not be totally on the up and up. But as long as you got a CPA's blessing on how to handle all that uh, benefits type stuff, education reimbursement stuff, that's uh, good to go. Yeah, great question, Todd. If you've got a question for us, you can write us a letter, but I would uh, suggest that you have us throw out the Haven Lifeline to you, stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail, or head to stackybenjamins.com. Right at the top, it says question for the show, question mark, and click that. And if you want to send us a letter, you can go down there or write me a note, joe at stackybenjamins.com. Uh, good news too, for people that are looking for a financial advisor, OG is taking clients now. So if you know that you need somebody in your corner, Here's how you get on OG's calendar. It's stackybedjamins.com forward slash OG. Got to say another thank you here at the end of the show to people that leave us reviews. Thank you for taking the time to tell other people about uh, this uh, quirky little basement produced show. And here's a five-star review from our chef says, learning nothing has never been more fun. Most of the time when a man invites me into his mom's basement, I politely decline and then dial 911. But Joe's mom's basement is the place to be. Thanks, guys, for all the laughs and the great information. I'll keep it to myself. And see that? They didn't keep it to themselves. They wrote a review on iTunes, and it's going up on Mom's Fridge. Thanks a ton for that. Also, thank you to the bloggers that have written about us recently. We've been uh, featured on two blogs, the Wall Street Survivor blog, Put us on the list of 15 best personal finance podcasts to know about. How about that, OG? Nice. Yeah. And then uh, also on the Mother Hustler blog, I want to make sure you say that slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, the Mother Hustler blog, 12 podcasts to help you get on the right track financially. Uh, we made that list. And uh, of course, top 10 best business podcasts were a nominee for that award in August by the Association of Podcasters. So a lot of, a lot of cool stuff going on. Thank you for everybody who's written about us, talked about us. We love you, man. Good stuff. Coming up on Wednesday, Greg Powell is a certified financial planner who talks about building your financial house. And you know how when financial planners talk about creating a plan, people kind of fall asleep. But when you talk about building your financial house and having different rooms that do different things, Greg says people wake back up. And so I love that analogy. So we're having Greg come by and talking to us about building your financial house on Wednesday. That's going to do it for today. Doug, what should we have learned today? So what did we, what did we learn today? Well, for, for it, it, is this thing on? Hey folks, Engineer Steve here. And I just got to tell you that we had to cut what Doug said here at the end of the show because. Well, remember, kids, don't overdo it with alcohol. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two comes from Gene Natale, not Gene Simmons, as Doug said when he originally recorded this. Teach kids about the Roth IRA and about compounding interest. That gets them excited about money, and then the sky's the limit for the next generation of savers. But the big lesson? Martinis, like any beverage of that type, are for sipping, not gulping. While well, Doug thought it would be fun to pontificate about how Ben Franklin looks like a, quote, really cool stud that would have been happy to say he was Doug's wingman, there's no real reason to even mention any of that in this show. Special thanks to Gene Natale for stopping by. You'll find the book, The Missing Semester, about financial education in our schools at themissingsemester.com. And a very special thanks to Audiotape. Because of audio tape, I'll be able to paste Doug from a previous episode back into this show from this point forward. Here we go. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Kathleen Selmans handles design, newsletter, and classroom opportunities. If you'd like to learn more, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash classes. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and 
I'm pretty much the guy in charge of everything around here. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. For those of you new to Stacking Benjamins, what happens in the after show stays in the after show. Richie, by the way, our producer, Richie rudder was telling me that when he was applying for the job and he's listening to the show to make sure that he nails the interview, right? He said, you know, the show would end and he'd, and he'd stop listening. And uh, one time he looked at his thing and he said, there's, there's like 15 minutes left. <laughs> What's going on? What the heck? And so he said that he just kind of fast forward a little and we start talking again. And then he goes back to the couple episodes he'd listened to before. And he's like, every time they have it. Well, not on Friday, but uh, anyway, uh, yeah. it's pretty funny when your producer is finding the Easter egg. <laughs> one of the people going surprise. Yeah. So the last couple of days have been just a, a bender from all sorts of different, you know, Speaking angles. Of, speaking of Doug. <laughs> yeah. So uh Steak Brother is uh about to get married in uh, another month. And so he had his Is that what we're uh, gonna call him now, Steak Brother? I call him like <laughs> but, um, but, that, but that's between you and him. Yeah. So I have two brothers, so we have to separate them. You know, they're steak brother and then just normal brother. Uh, so steak brother is getting married in a month and some change. And so he had his party this weekend, his festivities celebrating his last few, few days, few months as a bachelor. And he had this whole vision planned, you know, six months ago of what he wanted to do. Right. He wanted, he was, they were going to go to Vegas, be like 20 dudes. They're going to get a penthouse, shoot sniper rifles in the desert, race Ferraris down Vegas Boulevard, you know. And then I reminded him that he works at the Steak and Shake and all his friends work at Steak and Shake. So probably none of that's going to happen. <laughs> so he ended up uh, doing his bachelor party a little closer to home, which is smart. I, I completely <laughs> think that that was a smart thing to do. At the but Steak for and me, Shake after hours? Yeah, yeah. Well, they can run it out. It's like uh, it's like when people run out the... Uh, Bouncy house? White Castle, you know, to get married. It's the same kind of same deal. But, um, but you got married in a castle. You did. I mean, come it on. Just, it was a White Castle. Um, no, they're not getting married in White Castle. But uh, but so he's been planning this thing for a while. And I said, boy, that weekend really is bad for me. And and he says, uh, well, you know, it just is what it is. That's when we've decided to do it. Said, okay, fine. So finally, he, he you know, he's got this whole thing booked, right? He emails me and says, hey, brother, here's the dates for the bachelor party. It's this day to this day. I said, well, first of all, it should be one day, not multiple days, but let's set that aside. I said, okay, I can only come in on Friday and I have to leave Saturday because it's not in our home and not where I live. I have to fly up there. And he says, well, why? I said, because my anniversary is the day before your bachelor party. So talk about, you know, <laughs> cutting it too close. Way too right? close. Way too close. So then I got to fly from down here all the way up there for a golf tee time at one. We do the whole thing, the whole night party thing. I got to fly home because the next day is Father's Day, which, of course, is yesterday. And I, I don't know about you, but I kind of like being around my family on, on days like that. Yes. Um, so so I've earned some airline miles and hotel stay miles and car rental miles and, and, then, um, and then Father's Day. So whew, that's all I got to say about that. I really can't talk too much about the uh, bachelor party because uh, there's only so much that goes on at a steak and shake. Um, so much that goes on or so much that comes off. 
Hey, yo. Yeah, he had this whole, he had, he thought his bachelor party was going to be like the hangover. Do you remember your bachelor party? Oh, I hated my bachelor party. Was it anything like the hangover? Um, I don't, I don't really know how much I want to talk about the bachelor party. because sure, I'll talk about mine. Well, so, I can tell so, you one thing that happened. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing that happened and this was horrible. So a bunch of guys and they, they took me to an establishment where women undress. We got that part. We figured that out. Yes. You just said establishment. Yes. They took me to an establishment. They hired somebody to come over and to sit on my lap. And uh, so this person is sitting on my lap and she takes off my shirt and she pulls out my underwear and she <laughs> rips the band off it for, and ties the band around my head. And at this point, <laughs> at this point, by the way, I don't think any of this is it's like a, you got like a super wedgie from a stripper. Well, well, oh no, 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 dude. It gets worse. It gets even worse. <laughs> she takes my belt off, right? She takes my belt off. She leans over me. So now her chest is in my face which isn't all bad. That's the best part of the whole thing. And she starts whipping me with my belt, like hard, like soup. It hurt so bad. It was, it was the worst thing ever. And, and I reached up and I grabbed them. I like grab, I like grab both of them. And she backs off me really quick and goes, he's touching me. You got to tell your friend, you got to tell your friend to stop fondling me. And I yelled at her. I go, I'm, I'm not fondling you. I'm trying to get you to stop whipping me. Get off me. (laughs) Devil woman. I want you to stop whipping me. And I had these, I had these scars on my back and we actually took pictures of it. And there was for a little bit, there was, and and, and I just decided I had better things to do, but there was a discussion among some of my friends who were in law. I seriously, if you saw, you can't get that treatment. (laughs) You've been trying for 25 years to get that level of what abuse. Re- and- what a replicate that night. No, it was horrible. Uh, that was horrible. And my brother-in-law at the end of the night, we're all having fun in this limousine and we look over my brother-in-law his laying across, you know, the, the couch in the front mm-hmm. and there is lava coming out of his mouth. And, uh, and so then the limousine driver made us pay a monster fee, like a monster cleanup fee. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, not real lava. Okay. I got it. Yeah. I'm like, did you drink a lava lamp? No, like, no, what? no, 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 no. He, yeah. I, I got it. I he, figured it he out. He drank a lava good. lamp's worth of uh, stuff. <laughs> he drank a whole bottle of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mine was nowhere near as exciting as that. In fact, in fact, it was like at a dude's house. It was fun. And we had some people come over and we played cards and we drank a keg of beer. And then we were supposed to have some entertainment and they didn't show. So me and Mrs. OG were talking sometime after our respective bachelor bachelorette parties. And finally she comes out with it and says, so how was the, you know, entertainment? And I go, well, how was your entertainment? She goes, you wouldn't believe this, but he didn't show. I go, huh? Mine didn't show either. So how about that? we had I don't no, know. we had no entertainment. Not, not that I would want your type of entertainment, That's but, the, uh, but that's know. how it should be. Right. You just, you get a cake, you know, keg of beer, you grill some steaks, you play some cards. We did all that for my brothers. We went out and played golf. Right. We went out and played golf, had some steaks, bunch of guys at the house. I'm staying overnight at my brother's house and uh, I'm with my cousin, Dale. And this, the last thing I remember that night, I'm playing a game called Black or Red. You're playing Black or Red? Black or Red is a horrible, horrible game. And uh, God, oh, my, you know, I'm almost 50 now and I'm just cringing at this story. Uh, so say Black or Red. Black. We turn over the next card. If you're right, I drink. If you're wrong, <laughs> you drink. You've got you got 52 cards. Oh you're, boy! Y- y- oh, it's horrible. So that's the last thing I remember, right? Yeah. Then I had this dream that I'm standing next to a stream, and, and there's a, oh, there it is. And there and there's a tree there, and uh, and the stream the the stream <laughs> keeps like hitting the rocks and it keeps hitting my feet. So so. I'm up against the tree. I don't know why I don't just back away in my dream from the, from the stream, but for some reason I got to keep standing there. So I, I, I put my hand up against the tree and I put my feet back further away from the stream and, uh, and the water keeps hitting it. So I go back further and further and further and the water still keeps hitting my feet. And, uh, and then you wake up and somebody's peeing on you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh. Nobody's peeing on me. I- <laughs> Even better. I'm in the I'm in the corner of my brother's living room with my arm no. against the wall. 
with no. my with my yeah yeah. Oh we, uh, man. We had to go. I'm proud to say I've never done that. We had to go get a steam cleaner the next day. I paid yeah, for did. it, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, my my future <laughs> sister in law was not happy with me either because <laughs> they were going to live in that apartment. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it's a horrible. So it's a nothing hor- like that at uh, Steak Brothers. So, oh, Just uh, golf and beer. It was a great night until and then. steak and shake. Yeah, yeah. Don't play black or red. Do not. I'm going to make them play it next time and watch it. It's horrible. We'll see everybody later.